Good morning to each of you. Thank you for being here this morning. For those present in the auditorium, we're happy to see you. To those of you that join us online, and as, as of recently, that included uh, my family. Uh, we know that you would love to be here, many of you, and it's because of your continued um, fight against the COVID virus or maybe your exposure to it that keeps many of you at home uh, this morning. Uh, know that we are thinking about you and love you and want to see you very soon, but uh, we understand why you are where you are. And to those that are uh, struggling mightily, uh, as we've prayed uh, twice already, I know you even now, as am I, are in continual prayer uh, that recovery can be granted to those that are uh, suffering so greatly. And um, we are mindful of you and we love you very much too. Uh, it'll be read uh, at the end. Uh, a thank you note from my family, but uh, allow me just to say at this point to uh, each of you that uh, helped us during our battle with the COVID virus, uh, thank you is clearly insufficient and inadequate for all of the wonderful things that were done on behalf of our family, uh, the many acts of love and kindness, uh, the cards and the calls, the text and uh, the food and just an abundance of so many other things. And I, I know uh, more than all uh, your prayers and petitions to God on our behalf. Uh, we love you for each of those uh, things that you did and more. And um, if by chance this morning you're uh, curious, if you're visiting or don't know if you're even watching, uh, what's the church about? What's being a Christian all about? Well, it's about loving each other. It's about loving God primarily. But uh, Jesus said if we're to love God, then we have to love one another. And I'll assure you, you'll find in this place people who love one another and who will help you. And uh, we are trying our best to do that as we live according to the teaching of God's Word. We invite you to join us in uh, doing the same. And so uh, please allow us that opportunity. Uh, I told uh, uh, Brother John to have a uh, halftime uh, song prepared just in case uh, I run out of air or run out of gas. This is probably the longest uh, that I've stood or talked in a couple of weeks and uh, my energy level is not where I want it to be. And someone pointed out, well, yours is on, uh, you know, uh, a caffeinated kangaroo level. And I guess that's true. Uh, that's a word picture for you. But uh, I am uh, trying uh, to climb back up the uh, mountain of uh, stamina and endurance. So we made it through the Bible class hour. So uh, the Lord willing, we'll be able to do it uh, at this hour of worship and study. If you go back through just the last um, few generations, and uh, there are some who still recall uh, this day, and uh, I uh, have the connection with this day, which in no way uh, is impactful as to what actually occurred uh, when Japanese bombers uh, attacked uh, the naval fleet at Pearl Harbor on the seventh day of December, 1941. Uh, it was 40 years later when my sister was born on December 7th, 1981, uh, that I uh, came to know December 7th uh, as a day of some importance. But uh, there are a few of you that recall uh, perhaps this day and many more uh, that perhaps remember what your parents and grandparents told you about uh, the fear and the uncertainty that gripped our nation on that day, as uh, the president rightly said, which will and continues to live in infamy. Others more uh, in the audience uh, recall probably what was going on in your life uh, when you heard the news that President Kennedy had lost his life in Dallas on the 22nd day of November, 1963. And again, the uncertainty and the fear uh, that swept over the nation and what would happen as a result of that uh, tragic day. Uh, coming down now to uh, my generation and um, including more of us, uh, I can remember uh, school day was canceled uh, in Jackson County and I presumably perhaps even here in Cumberland County because of snow. Uh, so it was very exciting for me uh, enjoying uh, all things outer space and flight uh, to be able to watch a shuttle launch in person, not just watch it on the evening news, but uh, to actually watch the countdown uh, to that. I was able to do that uh, being home and then of course uh, just um, minutes after takeoff uh, the Challenger explosion, and I remember uh, trying to grapple with what that meant and uh, what would, you know, happen and everything as um, uh, a boy of only seven, what would be involved in, uh, you know, the recovery from that historical event. 
And then, of course, um, our thoughts are this weekend, especially with yesterday and continuing even to today, uh, the events of 20 years ago that most all of us in this audience can recall. Uh, there are a few who cannot. Uh, this is, and if you visited the uh, museum and the memorial site now, uh, this picture is actually enshrined there, and so I'm giving credit to David Monderer. Uh, he was a professional photographer, and he had just decided to set up uh, his camera on the pedestrian bridge there over the Hudson River uh, to take uh, a sequential set of images of the New York skyline. And uh, this picture timestamped 8.30 a.m., uh, 16 minutes later, then, of course, you know what transpired and then what continued to unfold the remainder of that day. Uh, you can recall what you were doing, how you felt. Uh, we had just celebrated uh, Amy's birthday a week before with the news that we would bring a new life into the world. And uh, that new life is at Freed Hardeman this morning uh, in our oldest son. But I remember the anxiety and the trepidation that just kind of instantly uh, put that joyous news side by side with this tragedy. And all of us have a story and all of us have experiences and all of us even subsequent to that continue to have things that uh, call our minds back to that. Should we think about things like that? Some people would say, well, this is a time to worship God. It is. And I invite you to go to Psalm 137 for a time when even God's people uh, were in the midst of national tragedy remembering. And I think it's appropriate that we do that. In Psalm 137, you have a psalm that is a... Uh, psalm that would be utilized in worship, perhaps at the temple, perhaps in synagogue, perhaps in family devotions, and perhaps in all three. The author is unknown, but the setting is clear. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive ask of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy... Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Now, this morning, I'm not going to give you an exposition of Psalm 137. It's an imprecatory psalm, as they're called. Uh, they are very challenging to properly interpret because it almost seems that there is a vindictiveness of God's people saying, God, pay back our enemies. And maybe they were right and just in making that plea as the people of God. I do not want you to equate these United States of America with ancient Israel in the sense that as they enjoyed His favor and His protection as a nation, that God is obligated in some way to likewise extend that same sort of protection and guidance to our nation. That's a false uh, manner of interpretation. It's been commonly done uh, even since our nation's founding. Instead, I want you to simply notice that they are asking and they are instructed. And this morning, I think it would benefit us to likewise follow them in remembering. I want to remember some things. This today is the site, and at the same time, while uh, I show you this image, I won't show you anything that would cause hopefully undue distress. I know that in our nation's capital, as well as in a field in a rural part of Pennsylvania, there are uh, those who took actions that need to be recalled and memorialized as well. I, I certainly am uh, aware of that. Instead, um, you can see the outline of where those two buildings stood, and you can see the memorial that uh, exists in that place, as well as the building that now replaces the two that were destroyed. What do we remember? What do we learn, if you will, in the sense of remembering from the events of 20 years ago? Uh, I tried the following Sunday, of course that was on a Tuesday, uh, to put together some thoughts. I was 22 years old, preaching uh, full-time for the uh, little uh, congregation in the Bargerton community of Henderson County, uh, Tennessee, while finishing up my graduate Bible degree at Freed Hardeman. And I had some thoughts on that day that... 
I hope were helpful. And even some of those uh, continue to uh, permeate my thinking even as I come down to the present hour. And here's what I want you to not only remember and not forget, but maybe to learn from this morning. And it was mentioned in prayer, and I'm glad that it was, and that is that evil er error exists. Three E words. Evil error exists. We were confronted on that day with the reality that truth is not relative. That all religions are not the same. That worldviews and philosophies matter. That thoughts and beliefs and ideas have indeed consequences if believed and acted upon. Now, unfortunately, uh, kind of a running theme throughout this lesson will be that while those things were recalled then, maybe they have all too easily been, even now, again forgotten. Ideas have consequences. Beliefs and philosophies have ramifications. If you turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul will tell us something beginning in verse 3 that's needful in this time of remembrance. How could it be that one group of men could act in such a way toward their fellow man, men and women? How is it that uh, such acts of terror, brutality, calculated uh, to inflict the greatest amount of harm, how is it possible that mankind could actually perpetrate that on his fellow man? Well, the reality is that evil and error exist. And when truth is ignored or when it is disregarded, when it is placed uh, in, a, in a place where uh, it's no longer held up to be something to be admired and a standard to be submitted to, when everyone is free to do whatever he or she might like, then things like this inevitably are the result. There Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, we, though we walk in the flesh, that is that we live, this is where we live, this is the realm in which we inhabit, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That word, word war is a strong one. And for some, uh, they would maybe even think it out of place. We war not according to to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The tendency is, and certainly in response to this act, our nation did defend its interest and try to seek justice for those who perpetrated these acts. And while there is a place, according to Romans chapter 13, for the nation and the one who leads it, the government who does bear the sword, and it's not in vain that that sword is born. Justice is to be carried out. Paul would caution us, and I would caution you this morning, that as we recall, what we are doing is primarily not in the physical realm. Instead, Paul said, we are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Verse 5 is especially the verse I call your attention to. It is our task this morning, and as was mentioned even in our prayer, that we cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We value in this land and always have liberty and freedom. And while there is a certainly uh, instinctual within each of us a desire to do our own thing, as it were, that liberty, that freedom can so easily be perverted and misused. And as we spoke of at the Bible study hour here in the auditorium class, it was Adam and Eve and their free will choice. No coercion on the part of God, no even manipulation by the serpent, but rather a choice to take all that God had given and disregard it. To live in a perfect place where every need was supplied and choose otherwise to do what God had said not to do, thinking perhaps that their thoughts and their disobedience to Him would bring something that uh, He had not offered or would be better than what He did. And so tragic are the results. That's sin. And the curse of that sin continues to plague our world, and we saw that in a very vivid way even on that 11th day of September 20 years ago. And that's what we're talking about even this morning. 
Now, people would say, well, preacher, you're quite overestimating your importance. You're uh, making this seem like all of this goes back to a disregard of God or of truth or of living life the way that you narrowly think it should be lived according to this book. Yes, that's precisely what I'm saying. And it's really that powerful. It's really that simple. The knowledge of God and who He is and who we are and what our response should be to Him is the cause. Now, we are thankful, and I would be remiss if I would say otherwise. I'm thankful that at least on mostly a day-to-day basis, the consequences of disregarding God are not this severe, either in your life or in mine. God in His grace and His mercy uh, does not uh, cause us to suffer as that day brought suffering to our world, to our land. And yet... The reality is, as we live in pile days upon days, and as there is coming a day when our days here will end, certainly the events of the current climate remind us of that, with disease, with sickness, with sorrow, all that will matter then on that day is whether I have done as Paul here told me to do, or if I have lived in a way where my evil error and the beliefs contrary to God's Word were entertained and were accepted. What's our task in response? Well, our task to remember is this, that this evil error, and yes, it was centralized in one false belief system. Call it Islam. Call it radical uh, Islam, uh, Islamist uh, terrorists. Call it whatever you will. It's something against the knowledge of God. And today, while there are uh, those who would try to castigate that one particular religious group, We should be equally understanding and equally aware that anything, Paul says, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God must be rejected. Romans chapter 1 tells us, unfortunately, in that day of the first century where the knowledge of God was suppressed, even though it was clearly known by individuals who then, claiming to be wise, illustrated their own foolishness, and yet we see the same play out day by day in our world as well. Evil error exists. We remember that from 20 years ago. I remember, as do you, that humble heroism, it happened over and over. And I'm putting these in the present. That is, it happened on that day and it's happened on the day since and it continues to happen as we look back and as we reflect. So many stories and illustrations of this. Uh, The only good thing about Uh, suffering and being quarantined as we were uh, at home during our COVID battle was uh, we were able to watch some programs uh, that were devoted uh, to a remembrance of this day. The National Geographic Channel uh, had um, an entire series that they produced and uh, some of those stories I would not run across previously. And um, and amazing to see the heroism uh, of firefighters and police officers and port authority individuals and just common everyday individuals. Here's what Jesus said in John 15. Jesus said in verse number 12, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And I know that some of you appreciate those words even more so than I do because you've been in that crucible Uh, when that very sacrifice was required. And you've maybe even watched comrades do that uh, for you, or you have had uh, the potentiality of having to make that choice yourself. And we salute those who have uh, done even that. And this day, those who uh, have done that, again, we recall them with honor because that is what they are deserving of. But what do we, in remembering that, recall? Do we recall that Jesus is not putting uh, this simply within the context of a time of great chaos? We should. You see, in moments that are big, big moments, scary moments, in those times when there are uh, opportunities uh, really to rise to the occasion, we can see uh, bravery and courage and valor on a level that's not normally observed, uh, but yet on a day-to-day reality basis in the simple small things that life puts before us are we willing to show the sort of love that Jesus is asking of us here I mentioned in my uh, just remembrance of gratitude and I'll say it again many of you have many of you are many of you do 
And I rejoice in that. And God rejoices in you because of what you're doing. You're loving. You're loving. And this evening at the worship hour, we'll talk about servanthood. That's our topic for this month. And I'll try to explore this idea in even greater detail. So I'm not going to step on a lot of that uh, this morning. But our duty to serve. Our duty to love. We remember it on this day when it happened so heroically in so many different ways, but it can happen every day and should as we love each other. But let me give you one final thought for this time of remembrance. What I recall about that day and the days since maybe is that the universal uncertainty was something that proved to be uniting. It was a time when there was just a prevailing sense of helplessness, a prevailing sense of what next or why this. And that served as a unifier. And no one, it seems, was foolhardy enough to put himself or herself forward as an expert or as a prognosticator But rather it was simply a time to be together. A time to grieve, to share, to support, and yes, to love. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus notes that this is something that should be expected in one way. And yet he calls us to a higher plane in remembrance of events just as this one. In in the setting... Those people were very distraught. And they tell Jesus, verse 1, Luke chapter 13, about some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. The best that we can tell historically, even though Dr. Luke doesn't give us the background details, other Jewish historians from the time period mention uh, that Uh, Pilate, as it was his charge as the Roman procurator to keep peace, uh, periodically just exercised his iron-fisted rule and uh, to show the people that they were always vulnerable and always under uh, the control of Rome. He sent his soldiers disguised into a group of worshipers uh, on a recent occasion and uh, just uh, slaughtered. Several of them. We're not sure. There are varying estimates from a few dozen to maybe a few hundred. And again, the Bible doesn't say, so historically we're only left with those guesses. That's what happened. And even as the song before we began this lesson asked the question, you know, why is it? Why do we try to do our best and things don't turn out like they should? Why? Jesus said, do you suppose... These Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Do you think that they were deserving? Are you trying to connect the dots? Are you trying to say uh, that God punished them in this way? And as we think about the events of 20 years ago in our nation, those same questions were raised. And today they're still being raised. Uh, People are asking even about a virus or a disease. Do you think that this is some sort of punishment or some sort of Um, cataclysmic example of God's judgment? Jesus didn't entertain that notion. He said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. No, that's not the answer. Verse 4, for our purposes and our setting historically, this even more eerily parallel illustration, those 18, Jesus knew them, numbering them, on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Again, we're not sure of the details. Some say it was still under construction uh, and that it was a construction project where Jewish workers were working on behalf of Rome. And so uh, there are those who are maybe insinuating they worked for Rome, they betrayed their nation, they didn't serve God and resist. And so that was God's punishment. Uh, Jesus likely aware of whatever those details were, true or not. Those on whom the tower fell and killed them, those 18, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Think that they received that judgment simply because of their egregious behavior? No. Verse 5. But unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. 
the why question the Lord doesn't answer. He doesn't answer it here. He doesn't answer it in the Old Testament when his servant Job asks it. He doesn't even answer it when his very son cries out from the cross himself, My God, why have you forsaken me? And that question remains unanswered this morning. But that universal uncertainty united us to help us recall and remember that there is coming an appointment. And Jesus said that appointment, one's preparation for it, must, re, uh, must include their turning to God or their perishing will be the result. You see, the question this morning is not whether we will forget. We will never forget. As long as we have cognitive ability, uh, I think all of us can conclude easily that a remembrance will be had. But will we ever learn? That's really the question that's more pressing for you and I. Will we ever learn? Will people, will our world ever learn that there is truth? And that truth is in God and in His Word and in His Son. In no other man, no other prophet, quote unquote, no other philosophy or belief system, no other approach politically, economically, socially or otherwise. Will we ever learn that God's way is right and submit to it? Will we ever learn that there are opportunities to serve every day? They may not be as dramatic as rushing into a burning building to save lives, but small acts of love are presented to us, the opportunity to do them every day. Will we ever learn that the simple act of loving our neighbor, loving one another, is something that can be done every day? Will we ever learn that there is a universal uncertainty to life? And the only thing important to do in view of that is to make preparation for it. The illustrations are numerous, and they're scattered as we've just uh, gave you at the opening a sampling of them, of individuals who never imagined. And I don't know what the percentage would be even uh, for those who you might be able to interview if the Lord should grant on the other side of eternity. Tell me, were you expecting this? Were you making uh, this as a part of your daily expectation? This accident, this tragedy? Well, of course not, silly. How foolish to suggest otherwise. And yet, will we ever learn that we too may suffer a fate very similar. And thus, as Jesus said, the only thing important to do this morning is to repent, else we perish. To turn to God and to trust Him, and to submit to His ways and follow His word. It's not a question of if we'll forget. It's a question of if we'll remember and if we'll learn. We know and we think of those individuals who in a moment with no prior inclination whatsoever, were snatched into eternity. And we mourn for them and for their families. And we cannot imagine the unbearable grief that remains in the hearts and minds of many. We pray God to feel that in some way with a measure of His comfort. And yet this morning the opportunity is yours in view of the same universal uncertainty about life itself about what tomorrow may hold, and not just tomorrow, what today may hold, to make preparation to be prepared, to meet your God in judgment, and to be assured of His eternal joy, and be a part of His uh, eternal home, a place called heaven that He's preparing for those who love Him and obey Him. This morning, have you made that preparation as a Christian? Have you been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you've not, there's nothing else that matters. There's nothing else uh, that mattered on that day for those, again, who were snatched away into eternity. People want to focus on uh, the lives that they lived and the roles they played, the fathers and the mothers and the sons and the daughters. All of those things are, if I might say and say it very kindly, merely details. And yes, they were significant details, 
they were details only in the sense that in comparison to their relationship with God, inconsequential. Because in the final analysis, all that matters is my relationship with Him. All that matters for you is your relationship with Him. If you're not a Christian this morning, the steps you see outlined are very simple. We believe that Jesus is God's Son. We trust in Him to be our Savior. If we put that trust in Him mentally, then naturally we will uh, then carry on to do that as He has instructed us to do, which He tells us here, as we've said in Luke 13, to repent, to turn our lives entirely over to Him, to give Him the ownership and to give Him the direction of our lives. Jesus said further that once we do that, if we will be baptized, be immersed in water, a step that for many uh, they choose to disregard or ignore its significance and outright even disobey the instruction that the Savior gave. But that's what he says that we do when we're buried with him as he was in death. A transformation takes place. Our sins are washed away. New life is given to us, a new identity as a child of God made a part of his body, the church. This morning, you can do that. Last week, uh, we rejoiced. Uh, to see one take that wonderful step of obedience. Maybe this morning you'll be encouraged to do the same if you need to. Maybe you've done that as a child of God and uh, maybe living uh, these last 20 years uh, has helped you live with a renewed purpose and interest and uh, things like that. We can learn from them and we should be motivated uh, to do even more. And even now in the midst of a time of pandemic and fear and uncertainty, we still must be, as we said in that prayer again, the light in the midst of darkness. That's what God would have us to be. If that light that is in you as God's child is not bright like it should be, remove the sin that hinders and that uh, clouds that judgment uh, that you have that puts you on a path away from God. Instead, turn back to Him. Fully repent. Beg His forgiveness. And when we pray to Him, He assures us that He will, in fact, forgive. Will we forget? No, we won't forget. We'll remember. Will we learn? Let's learn and be wise this morning. And if need be, your life needs to be made in harmony with the will of God. This opportunity is given to you to do that. Make that known to us and come as we stand and sing together.